Good afternoon. Welcome to another edition of the COVID-19 Response and Recovery Task Force Virtual Town Hall. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, and today we're uh, gonna able to, we will be able to share some additional good news uh, with regard to further easing, easing of restrictions. I am Michael Beck, the Administrative Vice Chancellor and Co-Chair of the Task Force. I'm joined here today by my Task Force Co-Chair, Michael Morans, uh, Professor of History and past Chair of the Academic Senate. With us to help field your questions are some familiar Task Force faces for those of you who have been following these sessions. We have Adriana Galvan, Dean of Undergraduate Education and Chair of the Task Force Education Working Group. Andrea Casco, uh, Chair of the Graduate Council, Professor of Bioengineering at the Samuel E. School of Engineering and a member of the Education Working Group. Megan uh, McAvoy, Chair of the Undergraduate Council, Professor of Microbiology, Immunology and Molecular Genetics and member of the Education Working Group. Michelle Sityar, who is the Executive Officer uh, for Environment, Health and Safety and the member of the Public Health Compliance and Infection Control Working Groups. Peter Cantona, who is the Chair of Infection Control Working Group, clinic, Clinical Professor of Medicine at the David Geffen School of Medicine and Adjunct Professor of Public Health in the Fielding School of Public Health. Uh, Annabelle D. St. Maurice, who's the Assistant Professor of Pediatrics in the Division of Infectious Diseases, the David Geffen School of Medicine. She is the co-chair of infection prevention, co-chairs the infection prevention officer position at UCLA Health and is the member of the infection control working group. And we also have with us Adrian uh, Malke, who is the assistant director uh, in insurance and risk management. Before we get started, I have a few housekeeping items to go over. Uh, the town hall will be recorded and available on the UCLA YouTube channel later today and accessible via the UCLA COVID-19 website. We appreciate all the questions we have received from all of these town halls and uh, all these questions are used to uh, help add additional uh, answers uh, to the Q&A that's available online. And for answers to the questions that we are not able to get to during the town halls, uh, they will be posted on the UCLA COVID-19 website. For those participating via Zoom, and you may have other questions besides those that have already been submitted, uh, please use the Q&A function, not the chat. So now I'll turn it over turn the screen over to my colleague, Professor Morans, to provide an update on our plans for fall teaching. Thank you, Michael. I can figure out how to make this work for me. That yeah, looks great. Perfect, Michael. Okay, I'm just not sure if I can get this to move. There we go. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Um, what I wanted to do was very quickly try to sketch in where we're at. As you all know, um, the, uh, the public health situation in Los Angeles County and in many parts of the nation has increased, has improved dramatically um, over the last few months. Uh, these are just some uh, quick slides to let you know to, so that you can see where the peaks are and where we are now. Um, you can see the tremendous improvement since the high in January and February uh, to where we are now. The same thing can be said uh, for the campus. Uh, you know, back in January, we had really tremendously high number of cases given how few uh, people were on campus. But as you can see um, for the last week, and this is actually even slightly higher than the previous week, the numbers have been um, extremely, extremely low. Although uh, we did have, um, unfortunately, uh, several fatalities um, a couple of weeks ago. 
in any case, based on this, um, we're able, we think, to be much more optimistic about our ability to um, return to learn and work um, in the fall. And we thought we would just quickly um, give you uh, some general updates on where we are at this point in terms of planning. Uh, at this point, we anticipate um, somewhere in the vicinity of 80% and possibly higher um, of primary and secondary sessions and sections to be taught in person in the fall. Um, there will still be some remote um, teaching in order to, to accommodate students who for one reason or another are unable to return. Uh, but our sense of, of the um, percentages of classes that can be offered in person, it goes up um, frankly every week. Uh, it's our expectation from the county that um, physical distancing requirements will be brought to an end in July. Uh, we've recently let department know, departments know that classroom capacities can in fact increase to 100%. Um, that while classes over 60 may continue to be taught remotely, um, we are receiving um, requests if space is available for larger classes to begin to be taught in person and, and departments should feel free to submit those requests. There is no longer a maximum class size in terms of, of in-person teaching. Um, as I say, departments should continue to plan for some remote options for students, although again, this is to focus um, mostly on those students who will be unable to return as opposed to a worry about the county now forbidding us to have in-person sections. And um, it's unclear at this point whether masks for vaccinated persons will be required um, or um, how the masking will work in classrooms. There will, as always, um, continue to be student um, ADA accommodations. If a student needs an accommodation, um, you should refer them to the Center for Accessible Education um, as we would with any other medical or disability accommodation. And CAE will then engage in an interactive process um, to determine an appropriate accommodation um, that works with, for the student, um, is acceptable to the student's doctor um, and to the faculty in the department. Uh, one thing that we want to um, make clear is that there are a variety of, of acceptable accommodations and um, you know, simply creating a new remote course is not considered at this point a reasonable accommodation, which means that faculty are not required uh, as far as we can tell to make in-person courses available remotely as part of this accommodation process. Obviously, if there's a remote section, that's a different matter, but faculty will not, we expect, be required to um, create a remote uh, version of an in-person class um, in order to um, come up with a reasonable accommodation for students. In terms of the staff, um, it's our expectation that employees that are now working remotely may be asked to start returning to working on site um, in the next few months to prepare for return to in-person instruction. Um, but this will be an ongoing process. Remote work may continue if the department determines that the work can continue remotely. Um, work schedules may include flex work options where some employees work on site while others work remotely um, or in which they alternate. Um, and that this is gonna be an iterative process. In other words, nobody expects that as of July 1st, managers and employees will have worked out exactly what they need in the long-term. You know, our, our hope is to bring people back um, in a way that works for each unit. Staff working three days or more remotely per week are eligible <clears throat> for a $1,000 home office furniture allowance. 
Um, departments will provide appropriate computer, or laptop, tablet for those working remotely. Um, staff are working remotely are responsible for providing appropriate internet and communications connectivity from wherever they are working. But again, this will be an ongoing process that we expect to begin in June and July. Uh, we're happy to say that we um, now are planning on having the residential halls um, open for triple occupancy, the rooms open for triple occupancy um, with vaccinated, um, if they will be populated by vaccinated students. Uh, Off-campus apartments will have regular occupancy and it, they will be a mix of vaccinated and those unvaccinated students with approved exemptions. I should note that, the, that there may be some unvaccinated students in the residential halls if um, they're required to being in a residential hall through the normal ADA um, com compliance and accommodation process. Dining halls and campus restaurants we expect will be operating at full capacity, both indoors and outdoors. COVID testing will continue. Um, we're transitioning to a new testing um, system, June 21st, um, run by SwabSeq. Testing centers will close on July 12th and the transition to test kits distributed via special vending machines um, will begin. You can see a lovely uh, photograph of what that will look like. Um, and we'll maintain at least one staffed pick up and drop off site. Uh, that if you are a vaccinated student, faculty or staff, you will not have to undergo the surveillance testing program. Although there will be expanded wastewater testing of all on campus and undergraduate um, apartment buildings. Uh, students who are unvaccinated will have a somewhat different uh, situation in the fall. All who return will have to test upon arrival or show a negative test from up to 72 hours prior. Unvaccinated students will sequester until they receive a second negative test. And students, faculty, and staff with approved vaccine exemptions will need to participate in twice weekly testing. Those students who wish to receive um, vaccine, vaccinations from UCLA um, should arrive two weeks early to receive the um, Johnson & Johnson vaccine or earlier if they wish to receive the two dose vaccine. But UCLA is committed to providing vaccines for students who are unable to gain them elsewhere. And that's it. So I'm gonna stop sharing and hand it back to Michael. Great, thank you, Michael. And recognizing that many have questions about the medical accommodation process and how we will manage the vaccine exemption request, we've invited Adrian Malka, uh, who's Assistant Director of Insurance and Risk Management to provide a quick summary of that pro process. Adrian, the screen is yours. Thank you, Michael, and thank you for inviting me. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to everyone. Uh, I'm going to briefly cover um, some of the process that we're implementing to request job accommodations for COVID-related issues, and also we're gonna to touch on the vaccine exemption request process. Let's see if this is gonna be. So um, an employee, meaning any staff, faculty, postdoc, uh, resident with an underlying medical condition, including pregnancy, or those with a disability may be at increased risk of severe illness from COVID. A request for an accommodation uh, triggers the obligation to engage in interactive dialogue about the employee's functional limitations, how those limitations impact performing their job, and then discussing uh, uh, exploring reasonable accommodations. Just as uh, Professor Moran's just indicated that this is a, uh, a rapidly changing um, field because the official health guidance is, is changing about vaccinated people and the mitigation of being at high risk. 
So we're going to probably be adjusting things, um, uh, including accommodations and who needs an accommodation as, as we proceed through this, um, through this year. Um, so accommodation requests due to a medical condition or disability, staff and academic appointees should complete and submit. There's a link here to a form that's on our website, um, which I've also list, listed here. Um, you'd be requested to then submit supporting documentation from a healthcare provider that addresses the employee's needs um, who is at increased risk or has functional limitations. Um, the requ this request for accommodation, uh, as all accommodation for disability types of requests are uh, facilitated by disability management specialists. Um, for us at UCLA or uh, in anticipation of volume, we may be uh, using the services of a vendor as well. Um, this is an interactive process involving the employee, their healthcare provider and the department to determine a reasonable accommodation. Some examples, these are just a few examples of some reasonable accommodations that might be implemented. Um, perhaps if the employee can continue to perform their work remotely, um, that might be implemented as a reasonable accommodation. Um, possibly providing a heightened level of PPE would enable the employee to continue working on site as well as increased distancing or erecting barriers or increased extra sanitation. If we can't identify a reasonable accommodation, then a leave of absence might be considered. And again, as we, we understand it, uh, even as of today, the, the, the land of um, restrictions is changing as we are able to lift those restrictions. So a request to work remotely solely based on age is not considered reasonable because age itself is not a disability and employers are not required to accommodate employees based on age alone. Um, back in the early days of, of COVID-19, um, there's information as including today that people of a certain age are at an increased risk of severe illness if they contract COVID. However, the vaccines might mitigate all of that. The, how it, we're still encouraging departments to be flexible when uh, a, an individual requests an age-based accommodation to continue to work remotely. And we're also awaiting ongoing protocol that um, Office of the President is in the process of developing. While working remotely, um, employees might also be needing to request an accommodation due to disability or functional limitations. These requests are handled in the same way as we've always handled requests for accommodations for employees working on site. The, the accommodation process is triggered, medical documentation would be requested, uh, re addressing functional limitations, and discussions would be uh, would be ongoing to arrange and explore what kinds of reasonable accommodations could be identified. We might engage our ergonomics ec experts um, to address workstation arrangements and mu musculoskeletal alignment. Going on to the vaccine exemption request, we're gonna touch on it very briefly here. This of course would be effective once the vaccine uh, mandate uh, becomes effective. Um, so requests for exemption due to a medical reason, uh, including pregnancy or disability, will require the employee to submit a request for a medical exemption and uh, additional documentation completed by the healthcare provider. Staff and academic appointees would be assisted by my office to request re exemptions due to a, a sincerely held religious belief. Those requests by by staff would be handled by employee and labor relations, either for campus or for health. And academic appointees would be assisted by the academic personnel office. In either case, for both types of requests for exemption, this would require engaging in interactive communication and exploring reasonable accommodations. Responding to vaccine exemption requests once, once mandated, the, the information and forms for for this process will be available once the vaccine mandate has become effective. 
Uh, we're currently working on including the request in the symptoms in the daily symptom survey to ease the request process. And as I mentioned before, depending on volume, um, the request might be addressed either by UCLA staff or by a vendor uh, to help us manage the volume of requests anticipated. Um, that was a short overview. I welcome everyone to uh, contact our office for additional information. And uh, with that, I'll uh, send it back to, uh, to Michael Beck. Great, thanks Adrian. And for those interested in reviewing the slides from either of the presentations more closely, they'll be uh, posted on the COVID-19 website with the video of the town hall later today. As we move into the more specific Q&A uh, portion of the town hall, I will ask Professor Morans to assist me in field, fielding the questions for our panelists. And as a reminder for those on Zoom, please use the Q&A function to submit uh, questions, not the chat. So I'll turn it over to uh, Professor Morans to field the first question to the panelists. Thank you, Michael. Um, I'm going to um, ask myself the first question uh, just because it, uh, it's something that uh, has come up a lot, which is um, when will we be uh, issuing whatever guidelines uh, for units to comply with for fall quarter operations. And I just wanna say that we hope to have um, guidance and templates um, out to you within the next week to 10 days. So um, hopefully that will um, happen very quickly. So let me start with <clears throat> and in, in a, um, uh, a question about face coverings, um, because that's uh, a very common one. And I'll, I'll ask Michelle or Michael to answer this. Will the university adopt the new CDC update that vaccinated people can go maskless indoors? Um, if so, will areas require proof of vaccination or will they be fielded through the symptom survey? So UCLA has not yet modified its universal masking protocol, and there's several reasons for this. One being that we are still subject to the Institute of Higher Education protocol that's stipulated by LA County, which does have the requirement that exists for research, instructional, and workplace settings. And along the same lines, we have Cal OSHA mandates, the COVID-19 prevention mandate, uh, which does stipulate that face covers or face masks rather still has to be worn by employees anytime uh, there is potential to come into contact with others. Okay, um, next question is for um, uh, either Peter, Peter or Annabelle. Um, and that's simply about what, what the status is um, on vaccine requirements at this point. Um, and uh, if you could quickly um, comment on uh, how effective the current vaccines are against the um, ongoing mutations. Well, I'll start with that. Um, we, we certainly will encourage everyone to get vaccinated that possibly can get vaccinated. And the reason being that the vaccines are even more effective than our wildest dreams when we've started creating these vaccines. Every study that's been looked at says the vaccines work and they work very effectively, not only in preventing disease, but preventing severe disease and preventing death. So we're encouraging everyone and requiring it as best we can that everyone get vaccinated. That includes students, faculty, and staff. I can talk briefly about the variants and vaccine efficacy. So there are good data, um, at least for the messenger RNA vaccines around the, the variants demonstrating that they're very highly effective. The Johnson Johnson vaccine, we're still beginning to learn more about, but we know that that was highly effective in areas where, um, for example, South Africa, where the um, variant was circulating. So I think, um, I'm very uh, hopeful that as more and more people get vaccinated, we'll have fewer variants circulating and continue to have highly effective vaccines. Many of you may know that there are booster vaccines that are also being developed, looking at um, vaccines specific to some of the variants and um, 
we may see those roll out sometime next year, but I don't think that those will necessarily be, uh, you know, something that's required in the fall or whatnot, um, because it does seem like these vaccines are highly effective. Thank you both. Um, I have a question that I, I think would go to um, either Megan or um, Adriana. And um, it concerns uh, whether or not uh, departments can request for pedagogical reasons, um, teaching a class that is less than 60 remotely. And if so, how would they go about doing that? Sorry, the question is that they can teach the class remotely if it's less than 60? Yeah, uh, if, they have, if they have pedagogical reasons for it. Yeah, how do they go about doing that? Yeah, they submit their requests through the um, process you've been using through the registrar's office. And then there's also um, the flip question um, from others, which is that although they recognize the need to um, have remote options for those students who are unable um, to return. They want to know what um, are the opportunities to teach in-person classes above 60 for um, students who actually are on campus. So there are options uh, for instructors to submit exception requests as Adriana said, to teach um, remotely for those that are smaller than 60 students enrolled or to teach remote or to teach in person for those that are larger than 60 students enrolled. And so there's, a, there's an exception request process. Um, but beyond this emergency remote authorization period during COVID, if faculty would like to continue teaching remotely or are online, there is a normal online course approval policy that would need to be followed. I would just... <clears throat> I would just add that with um, um, with the changes in uh, the public health situation and with the likelihood that um, the county will not in fact be insisting on a health officer's order in the, in the fall that would limit us, that departments should feel free at this point to submit requests for um, in-person classes above 60 um, it will depend on whether or not the registrar has general classes available, um, classrooms available. There is no size limit on these requests at this point. And um, you should certainly uh, feel free and in fact be encouraged to, um, to request that. The, the one thing that um, we do want um, people to be aware of and to keep in mind is that um, if it's a class that is um, a lockstep requirement, we do want there to be a remote option available for it so that students who are unable to return to campus would not have their progress to degree or their progress in their majors um, slowed down in any substantial way. <clears throat> but beyond that, um, departments can, at this point, um, submit requests for classes above 60 um, to be taught in person. And I, I suspect that both of the councils who um, authorized uh, the above 60 uh, opportunity for remote in the fall would actually be quite happy, many members of the councils if um, people took advantage of the in-person opportunity. Michael, do you wanna pick up with any questions? Yeah, there's a question that I think might be appropriate for you or uh, one of the, our team from the education committee. And if there is a requirement for, for providing some virtual options for students, but no alternative hybrid section is required do faculty need to allow for hybrid courses? Andrea, do you want to take that? Yeah, sure. I was just going to jump in. So I presume this question is centered around an expectation that a hybrid option may be 
required as an accommodation to a student. But as far as I know, hybrid or remote instruction is not a uh, required accommodation from CAE. So I don't think there's a situation in which case a faculty would be required to provide uh, a remote option for a student in a class that's otherwise completely in person. Adrienne, do you, um, do you wanna comment on that at all from your vantage point? No, I would say the same thing as Andrea. No, I meant Adrienne Maka. Oh. <laughs> Not Adriana, since I know you work with accommodations. Yeah, well, this, this question was uh, specific for students, um, but that would, uh, I think I would agree with the information that's been provided that uh, we need not create something in particular for one student where otherwise the course is being taught on site. I think the, the one distinction that, that I would make um, is that um, as Andrea and Adriana indicated, you know, you aren't required, we don't think you would be required to do this as an accommodation. Um, what I was discussing was situations where um, you have a lockstep course in a major in which only one section of the lockstep course is being offered. And in that case, our preference, you know, we would appreciate it if you would offer that one section remotely so that no one would be unable to take it. But that's a different matter from an in-person class in which um, there is there may be a student or a few students who, um, for one reason or another, um, have an accommodation uh, that makes it difficult for them to be in person. There are other accommodations that can be managed. And, and maybe another question for, I think this is for uh, Annabelle or, or Peter, but what are the expectations for booster vaccinations? And do we expect that they will uh, become a requirement and if so, do we have some thoughts as to when that might occur? So I kind of touched on it earlier, um, but the vaccines um, so far have been proven to be very highly effective through at least six months. And so I anticipate that most people will not need a booster, for example, this fall. And I think most infectious disease experts kind of acknowledge that. But as far as a year from now, I think that still remains to be seen uh, and we may have more data on that. And certainly, depending on the efficacy of these boosters and the efficacy of the prior vaccine, we'll have to come up with guidance about whether or not it's required. Peter, I don't know if you have anything to add. What I would add is there's really two reasons for booster vaccinations. One is that um, the variants are getting ahead of us, and the other is that immunity is waning. And there's no evidence so far that either of those things is happening. As far as the vaccines have been checked, they seem to have kept their immunity, but we've only got maybe seven or eight months worth of data on that. But we're cautiously optimistic that um, there won't be a severe need for boosters, but maybe in a year or two. Thank you, Peter and Annabelle. I have a question for Michael and Michelle. Um, it seems that, that room ventilation is very important in reducing the risk of COVID-19 infection. And the question is, um, do you have information as to the quality of ventilation in classrooms, the number of air changes per hour, and um, when will this information be distributed um, at large? So what is the state of the ventilation on campus at this point? Yeah, that's a great, a great question. So the university is following the ASHRAE standards for, uh, uh, for ventilation, which uh, deals with uh, both air exchanges and uh, and the level of MERV filtration. And so those facilities that uh, do not meet the standard, because there are some on campus, uh, the older facilities, those are uh, currently under evaluation to determine what the mitigation measures uh, might be uh, to be able to support the use of those spaces. And in some cases, and for instance, we're doing this now with the lab school and in Dodd Hall, we've installed uh, portable air purifiers 
that uh, are are able to uh, uh, meet the standard. And I'll I'll turn to Peter Katona because I know he's been uh, working very closely with uh, facilities management and EHS on this uh, issue and see if he wants to add anything or uh, possibly Michelle. Thank you, Michael. I would add, you know, we talk about filtration and air exchanges per hour, which are very important, but have to be measured in each room. And it makes it quite complicated to kind of get an assessment on every single classroom that we're going to be teaching. But also understand that there are other factors. There's the size of the room in terms of its volume, uh, how many people will be in the room, how long those people will be in the room. And that enters into a complicated measurement that's not easy to do. I, I would refer you to an excellent article in the New York Times of a number of weeks ago that basically had animations of how circulation of air goes into classrooms and it's easily accessible. But this is a complicated equation to do and there's algorithms to do it from different places that we're looking at to kind of get a better handle on this. And I will add that for the spaces that are not readily equipped with the HVAC parameters we that would be ideal. Under ASHRAE, we have identified in partnership with facilities management um, an augmentation process where we will provide uh, air purifiers for those spaces. And I know that there's, I was saying, I know there's a, based on the other, the questions are coming in live, I know there's questions about who's uh, paying for a lot of these costs of these different items. And so if the room, it's determined that, that the room uh, needs to have an air purifier, that's covered centrally. If it's simply a preference because somebody wants to augment uh, a space that already meets the standard, then that uh, would be the responsibility of the individual or the department. Michael, there's a question about, um, that isn't, um, I don't think exactly about COVID accommodations, but how is the campus preparing to accommodate students, staff and faculty with disabilities in terms of restroom use and accessibility, elevator use and accessibility, assistance in residence halls? So our expectation in the, in the fall would be very similar to how we would uh, make those accommodations uh, in a, in a pre COVID or post COVID environment. And so if in fact somebody needs accommodations uh, different, uh, more significant than what would normally occur. If it's a student, they should uh, work through CAE and uh, they'll uh, help identify what appropriate accommodations uh, need to be made through that process or uh, contact Adrian's group if it is a faculty or staff member and uh, they'll be uh, and we'll work through that interactive process to determine what the right solutions are. And Michelle, <clears throat> is a question. Could you, um, where is this? Could you provide clarification on out-of-state travel and quarantine requirements for vaccinated individuals that work on campus? Um, most individuals believe if they are vaccinated, they can return immediately to campus but the questioner um, is worried that Cal OSHA requirements still require a 10 day quarantine. Sure thing, there's a lot of um, confusion around this because it's a moving target. Um, but the latest from LA County, which is in alignment with CDPH, uh, the CDPH travel advisory is that um, there are exceptions for fully vaccinated individuals who do, who perform domestic travel. Um, and this is what the UCLA exposure management team um, who advises on anybody who is not cleared from the symptom survey and has to contact the hotline. Um, they are providing guidance in alignment with these requirements under the LA County protocol for travel. Um, there are different requirements if you travel internationally, in which case you need to comply with what CDC is recommending for those specific locations. But for domestic travel, um, if you are considered fully vaccinated um, and you are not symptomatic, then there's no need to quarantine. Thanks. And um, has there been um, a policy developed for in-person departmental seminar programs for the fall quarter? Um, do we expect that talks given by outside speakers to department faculty and students can be in person again? Is that a question for me? 
uh, or for Michael, for either you or Michael. I mean, my assumption is that we are going back to normal in the fall, but I wanted, this was question and I wanted to, to double check with you if you knew. We haven't, well, I haven't thought about that. Um, maybe Michael could shed some light. I'm sorry, Michael, do you mind repeating the question I was uh, the, the typing question, answers? Um, <laughs> the, the question really is about um, whether, whether we will still have restrictions on in-person departmental seminars with outside speakers in the fall. I mean, a lot of departments will normally um, invite speakers in to speak to faculty and students. And in the before times, they would have been um, yeah, no, that makes sense. They've been uh, held in person and they've been held in Zoom for the last year. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And we do expect that those uh, will be able to be held in person in the fall. Uh, if that depends on where the speaker is coming from, there may be uh, some uh, quarantine travel restriction or other travel restrictions. So that'll be dependent upon the individual speaker at the moment. If you're vaccinated, there aren't uh, travel restrictions, uh, but that would be the only limitation that I can see at the moment. Okay. And um, there are a lot of questions, not surprisingly, about parking for staff and faculty, and I assume students, if there are students on. So I wonder, Michael, if you could talk about um, the situation for parking, given that uh, uh, many people will not be as comfortable taking vans or public transportation as they return to campus. Yeah, thank you. That's a, a multifaceted sort of issue because uh, there are individuals who will, who normally took public transit or participated in a van pool or carpool who may decide that they uh, uh, don't want to do that uh, either early this summer when we start ramping up or in the fall. And so that'll put additional demand on parking and uh, which we know we have a limited amount of. So that really is intended to be offset by the individuals that continue to work remotely, either on a part-time basis or on a full-time basis uh, during the summer or in the fall. And uh, the way to accommodate those that are uh, coming just a few days a week you can actually use the online portal and uh, purchase discounted parking uh, specifically for that individual day instead of having to uh, purchase it as a visitor or purchase it as uh, a, a, through a monthly permit process. We've tried to accommodate and be as flexible as possible. And we do anticipate that there are going to be individuals who previously uh, did not uh, drive in a uh, single occupant vehicle that will be doing so in the in the fall. I can turn to Annabelle and Peter if they have a, a, any thoughts with regard to uh, public transit, but I know they uh, certainly read a lot that about the very limited uh, amount of spread that has occurred or known spread that's occurred via public transit that they're taking appropriate precautions and uh, individuals should feel that that's still an acceptable way to uh, commute. And Animal or Peter, I'm not sure if you wanted to add more to that. Uh, I would add a, a couple of things to that. For one is um, public transit is an exemption to masking. So you have to mask with public transit, whether you like it or not, in terms of the rules. And so that's the first thing. The other thing is if you're traveling in a vehicle, there are a couple of things that you can do to kind of minimize risk. And one is to open the windows and the other is to recirculate the air in the car from the outside. Um, those are two things you can do to cut down the amount of potential virus that's lurking in a car. But when you have three or four people in an enclosed space, it's really hard to prevent anything. And Peter or Annabelle, maybe you can talk, I know Annabelle referred to this a little bit earlier, but maybe you can talk really about the remarkable success of the vaccines. And if so, if you're in even a, a quite tight quarters with, with individuals that are completely vaccinated, that the risks are remarkably low uh, of contracting the, of the virus. Right, and um, I think the other important thing just kind of along those lines is there was a, 
interesting, I mean, interesting, unfortunate outbreak at a nursing home in Illinois where they did contact tracing of everybody who had been exposed to an individual who was unvaccinated and then transmitted the virus. And they saw that there weren't any cases of transmission from people who were vaccinated to others. So that's very reassuring. We actually also have been looking at data, uh, looking at viral loads in individuals who are vaccinated and have these breakthrough infections, which we know can rarely occur. And the viral loads of those people are much lower. So the spread from somebody who's vaccinated to somebody else is probably very low. Again, we don't know that 100%, but data thus far suggests that. So I think that the number one way you can protect yourself is to get vaccinated. And then if you are in these settings where there's um, transportation, that's public transportation, wearing a mask, um, and if you have the option to open windows, I think that's also very helpful. I, I would emphasize here that, that it's, uh, it's really important to understand that there's some controversy about whether or not the spread to and from vaccinated people is due to the low viral load or they're not actually getting infected at all. If you look at the New York Yankees of a few days ago where they had about eight people who got infected, all of which had been vaccinated with the J&J vaccine. So there is potential spread, but it may not be important. And we're kind of trying to figure that out over the next few months in terms of where we go with it. Thank you both. Um, I, this question that I think is, is most appropriate for um, Andrea and Megan, um, I slash we, I, I'm assuming this person is, recognizes that other people have gotten it, um, recently received a survey regarding remote learning. Does this mean the Academic Senate is considering offering um, classes remote moving forward? Um, students have told me they actually feel they've learned more because of lecture recording. That's the sure. question. Thanks, Michael. I'm happy to jump in here. Uh, the default mode for our, of instruction from fall moving forward is in-person instruction. Um, and so any request to do to continue remote learning, you need to go through the exception process for fall that's already set up. Uh, and the undergraduate council has also put into place um, approval processes for converting courses uh, that are currently in person to online courses, uh, not distinguishing between online or remote there, uh, just sort of distance education. Um, and so there is a process in place uh, for undergraduate courses who want to permanently convert to that. The Graduate Council is uh, reviewing this. We haven't finished that yet, but we will also have a process in place as well for instructors who have found this remote instruction mode to be extremely effective um, so that the councils can approve those changes on a more permanent basis. But otherwise the default is um, in-person instruction and remote instruction is not authorized beyond fall 2021 at this time. Megan, do you want, have anything you want to add to that? No, that was perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, here's one that I will ask myself, um, which is, uh, is there any potential that uh, departments will be asked to change their scheduling um, as a result of either current or future um, public health guidelines. And, and what I would say to that, um, as those of you who are department schedulers know, uh, is that we have recently um, let everyone know that um, they can, in fact, uh, schedule classes above 60 in person, um, and that we encourage that within uh, the limits that I, I mentioned before about uh, lockstep courses. I don't at this point think that changes will be mandated, but um, we would appreciate it if departments would seriously consider um, expanding their in-person um, offerings now that we have greater flexibility from the county. Students will appreciate it. Um, I suspect many faculty will appreciate it. Um, the more we can actually return to normal, the better. But um, I don't anticipate any uh, mandates that people have to do this. 
Michael, do you have any questions you want to share? Yeah, there was a, a question I was trying to find it, which I thought was a good one, uh, and I can't find it in the chat, but I'll uh, see if I can remember it correctly. And that's a question for a Adrian. Uh, why are we, or I'll change it. Could we actually start accepting uh, exemption requests or accommodation requests uh, today instead of waiting until the vaccine mandate actually comes into effect? You're muted, Adrian. Thank you. Um, I think that is a good question. I saw that in the chat myself. Um, the, we, we have considered that, uh, although I suppose that the, we're anticipating that the um, mandate will go into effect once the FDA, uh, FDA fully approves a, vac the, a vaccine. So uncertain when or if that would happen, um, you know, we didn't want to create work that we might not need to do, yet it seems on course to be, uh, to be uh, approved by the FDA. So we are probably going to look at um, putting something together sooner rather than later. And additionally, as I mentioned, we're um, working with IT on um, getting that process automated through the symptom survey. So all of these things do take time. Um, there's probably something that we could get up on our website in a more manual way sooner rather than later. And I do appreciate the question. And there's really a number of questions about the furniture allowance and who is eligible for it and uh, how that's happened. So I'll try and answer. I've tried to do some in chat, but I'll try and do the or in uh, Q and A. But I'll try and answer them. So the thousand dollar furniture allowance is uh, available for employees in the health system and at uh, on the main campus. And for those who have already purchased, uh, let's say, a chair or a desk and would like to be before the program became available and would like to be reimbursed, they will be eligible for reimbursement provided the equipment they purchased is considered er ergonomically appropriate. And uh, there's a wet for those that haven't purchased and are interested in doing this and uh, there's a website being developed right now through uh, cooperation with one or more of our vendors where you will be able to go online and select from different options of the furniture and uh, be able to select it. And if you select higher end uh, furniture to fit your home that exceeds a thousand, then you'll be able to uh, pay the difference uh, via the site and if you stay at a thousand or below, then uh, the site will just simply process the request. There was a uh, question with regard to who owns the furniture if it's purchased by the campus. And so there's a technical answer to that and that's that the campus would own the furniture, otherwise it becomes a taxable event and the, and the university will make a decision in the future as to whether or not uh, it wants the furniture back when a separation occurs. And so I'll avoid answering whether we intend to collect all of that furniture, not of course knowing what we would do with all of it uh, because I don't want to uh, change or impact whether the thousand dollar furniture is a taxable event and I'll let you uh, read between the lines there. So, those are the uh, a number of questions with regard to the furniture. So I'll turn it back to you, Michael, for another one. Yeah, um, I'm gonna, I, I think for our last question, I'm going to ask myself one last question um, because there are still were a lot of um, questions both in the chat and, and um, beforehand. And I just wanna make sure that um, we're clear if anybody wants to supplement what I say on this, please feel free. Um, there are a lot of questions concerning labs and small groups and um, density. It's, it's our expectation at this point that the county will not be insisting on any um, density uh, limitations in the fall, um, nor will there be distancing requirements in the fall. Uh, so there were 
uh, many questions about whether it was possible to do small group work, um, you know, how many students could be fit in a classroom. Uh, all of those things have been restricted because of a series of um, county, what are known as health officer orders, which have placed restrictions on our ability in terms of instructional um, spaces and workspaces. Uh, the, our expectation is that um, at some point over the summer, the county will release us from those, uh, those requirements. And so our hope is that in the fall, um, instruction uh, can proceed um, in a normal manner uh, at, or as close to normal as it can be under what we understand as a transitional situation. <clears throat> and, and, you know, we understand as well that there's going to be um, a period in which people will be finding their ways back to a comfort zone, uh, being involved in in-person interactions. Uh, so we're trying to be flexible with people and their expectations, but um, assuming that what we're learning from the county uh, this week continues, there shouldn't be a health officer order. And that means that we will not be needing to um, insist on distancing or density restrictions in the fall. Michael, do you have anything you wanted to add to that? No, I, I think that that, that makes sense. And I, I would just say that there's also a number of questions related to individuals who will not qualify for an ex uh, vaccine exception exception and are not otherwise going to get the vaccine, uh, how, will, uh, how will they, uh, will they be allowed to participate in work or school? And the, if, uh, one, as soon as one of the vaccines receives full FDA approval and assuming that the current vaccine policy goes into effect, then those individuals who are not vaccinated and do not have an, an approved exemption uh, are not permitted on, in university facilities. So if you're an employee and uh, your job uh, requires you to be uh, working on site and you're not able to come on site, uh, then you would uh, theoretically not be working. If you're a student, uh, this would be no different than uh, current immunization requirements for students. And if they're, if they're not meeting the requirement for immunizations, including COVID, uh, then they would not be able to enroll in in-person instruction. And we are not intending to provide uh, continued remote instruction. So, uh, Individuals do need to be vaccinated uh, or they need to receive an, a, a, an, a, an approved exemption if they're gonna be participating in campus activities in the fall. And so with that, we've really come to an end of the hour. Again, we wanna thank you for your time. I wanna thank all the panelists and uh, my uh, COVID partner, Professor Morans for all the work that he's doing as well as all the panelists that are here to answer your questions and uh, working to support uh, the COVID effort uh, for the last 15 months. And so I'm grateful for everybody's work and thank you all for participating and for your good questions and for the continuing to operate the campus uh, during this difficult time. Really wish you the best of the rest of your Friday and a wonderful weekend. Thank you for joining.